Let me get my coffee to wake up. Mm. Oh yeah. Mini, nothing better than coffee in the morning. Salud. Salud, Michelle. Michelle Bacho. <laughs> Salud. There we go. Hey, today we have a special guest, Michelle Barto. We're going to be talking about politics and all kinds of stuff. You can use this table too. Yeah. I don't know. Feel free. Um, but first, we're going to get to know you a little bit. Okay. Sounds good? Sounds good. Welcome to the show. This is ChristianPodcast.com with Beto and Mili. And today, like the overall theme is Do Politicians Lie? We're going to look at a verse in scripture where a very famous politician had a confrontation with the truth mm. okay and we're gonna have your take on it but first we're gonna get to know you okay you want to say something Millie? yeah when when you ask that question like i feel better like we all die we all lie oh lie yeah and we all I die mean, we all lie <laughs> <laughs> yeah. who say i never like in my life or i don't like mm, let me think uh -huh. i don't know but yeah uh, but i'm in this country like, uh what I'm just going to keep it at that. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I'm not going to yeah, say it's, anymore. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time and be here this hour with us. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so happy. Let, let me tell you guys that I know Michelle for now probably eight, nine years. Yeah, probably. Right? Yeah. We Our kids go to the same elementary school. And yeah, my Conrad and Dorian, they're pretty good friends. Yeah, so it's been really a blessing. Cute. It's really yeah. I really love their friendship because it's just so like innocent and sweet. Oh, thank you. There we go. Mm -hmm. When I hear you really nice okay. and clear. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So you know each other from school, right? And let's get to know your story first. Right? What's, what's your, your story? What's your story? <laughs> like if you would if if that's the only question we'd ask today, what's your story? Where would you start? Uh, okay, so I grew up in Isai Costa Mesa. My parents still live in the house where I grew up. Um, wow. I'm one, the oldest of four. Um, my we're, we're Catholic. My grandmother was a very um, religiously devout. She was always in church. Um, one of she was very into the um, involved in the charismatic movement when I was little, and so I spent a lot of my early years at um, prayer meetings and things like that. And I think that inspired some choices I made later on in life, but I didn't know that at the time that that would, is where that would lead. Um, I remember when I was really little in church, my mom tells me this story, so it's hard to know if it's a memory that I have or just I've heard the story so many times, but they were doing this special collection for a hurricane or some kind of mm. devastating thing. And um, I stood up in the church and said, give it to Jesus, give it to Jesus. <laughs> and I think that's just kind of like a, a funny uh, story and kind of embarrassing, but also kind of who I am. I just believe in um, service and I believe in giving back. And mm. um, everything I do always has been through the lens of uh, being a servant uh, of God. And um, I ultimately went to college in Ohio. The college that I chose, it was Franciscan University of Steubenville. Part of the reason I chose the college was because it was far away from my very tight-knit family. So I mm. needed, needed to get away and see other things. And Ohio is so different than here. It's beautiful. Beautiful. I love it. But very, very different than mm -hmm. growing up in uh, Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. And um, it was a big culture shock. The Amish were like with their wagons mm -hmm. were so beautiful 20, yeah. like 20 minutes down the road there was no starbucks it was like a whole <laughs> whole different world but was uh, that a problem it was a huge problem <laughs> yeah you, you need coffee every day like to get yeah well going? i mean they had like drip coffee but you get kind of spoiled growing up here and having your oh. starbucks yeah. you know yes yeah <laughs> um and so um you we would drive like 25 minutes 30 minutes to, to go get coffee that wasn't mm. just like you know off office dark brewed coffee now we can just have great coffee all the time with our keurigs and things but back then it was like you know really gritty um and i played soccer there um which mm. is another reason i wanted to go there um i studied computer science but um i got a full ride there which is another reason i chose but probably the biggest reason that i chose which i don't usually go like tell people when they ask why i chose to go there is um 
just the the character of that school was people who are there to be servants. I would say some mm-hmm. of the best people, some people I would call saints, are attended that that college. They were uh, they wanted to be missionaries. They wanted to be priests. They wanted to be nuns. They, if you were there, everything about daily life was about service. So it was a little odd for a college experience. Mm-hmm. Um, there, you know, we had uh, we didn't have sororities or fraternities. We had what we called households, and they were all themed around some kind of element of Christianity. Um, the household that I was part of was um, themed around the divine mercy of Jesus. So that was, we'd get together once a week and we would just talk through all of those things and um, talk through what that meant and talk through the scriptures of them, a mass that day. Um, it was good. We called that our, our Lord's Day, but it was on a Saturday afternoon. Um, anyways, going through all of that um, and kind of taking that and figuring that I would lead a life of service through like building houses. And um, I was fully focused on the business world and uh, computer science. And I wanted to go into consulting and have a big career that way um, and do my service on the on the side in a way. Um, so I particip- I worked for a women's shelter for a little bit. And um, I worked with a crisis pregnancy center, um, just any way to kind of bring what I had um thought it should needs to be part of my life mm-hmm. into, you know, my my off hours, my weekends and my after work. Um, and then um, in between then met my husband, got married, um, had wanted to maybe move back to the East Coast, decided to move back home. We got married here and we uh, I worked for a couple of years. Uh, we started teaching at our church together, which was really great mm. um, before we even got married. And we did that for about 10 years teaching the high school kids, which was super fun. Um, eventually, I think we got too old. And so uh, <laughs> it, it was really like relatable when you're 23 and yeah. 24 to a 16 year old is a lot less relatable when you're the same age <laughs> as their parents. Yes. They're like, okay, mom and dad. Um, mm-hmm. But um, that was a huge part of it. And I think then I had my kids and we, you know, we did things like help with Project Hope Alliance and help with church. But service has always been something that to me is a mandatory part of being a Christian. And that's how I live my life. Um, I decided to re- get into politics um, because I was very involved with the PTA at my kids' school. And I saw a lot of things which I felt like couldn't be helped by being a volunteer, someone needed to be to take a leadership role to make things better, not just for our school, but for other schools in the mm-hmm. district. Um, because a lot of the issues that I felt were there were issues throughout the whole district and not just at my um, kids' school. Um, and so did that and never had run a political campaign, didn't hire a consultant the first time, didn't know really what I was doing. Everything I did, I sort of talked to people and looked up on the internet and um I had some great um, mentors during that time, but overall was just figuring things out based on the fact that I run a marketing campaign and I know a marketing company and I know what um, I can build a website. I can run a social media um, campaign and anyways, did that and got on the school board and was um, it was a really challenging. The first year was really interesting um, because within minutes we had an issue at one of our schools and I found myself on national TV like within six weeks of being on the job and because um, I can even though I'm actually a pretty shy person like I don't mind speaking up and I can speak up when things need to be said so I found people saying oh Michelle you're here come talk about come talk on CNN about this issue and I was I mean, I really came from the trenches of having young children and trying to run a business on the side and nap time and just getting my youngest into kindergarten. And now I'm on national TV. So a lot of what I've done, um, the transformation in myself that has had to happen, the confidence um, has been because I just, I pray so much and it's like everyone has their daily routine. Mm. And, um, you know, a big part of my daily routine is scriptures, is my rosary is, you know, just saying a, a prayer that everything I do um, fit into whatever God's will for me is that day. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just try to do that because otherwise I think um, I would have fallen down a long time ago because mm. it's just, you know, it, at the end of the day, I'm like a such a detail-oriented problem solver and I like people, but I'm not like the star, like this. I'm never going to be the person on the stage who's doing the tap dance and is the star mm-hmm. of the show. Mm-hmm. Um but um, anyways, so got into that, got involved with that. Uh, the blessing, I think, was 
being as much as it was difficult was being on a school board during COVID because I was the only person on the school board who had children. Mm. So, um, a oh, lot wow. of, yeah, so a lot of the decisions that were coming from the state that we had to navigate and, you know, decide how much we were going to push back on, you know, I was the one voice out of seven that could say, hey, this is not working. This is not adorable. Like some people would see kids, the kindergartners on Zoom and go, oh, that's so cute. They're so cute on the screens. And like, yeah, they have cute faces, but what's happening is not cute. You know, this, mm. is, a, this is something that needs to be, that we need to do what we can to push back, to get people back in class as soon as possible and just recognize that. So um, as hard as that was, I think that that was a huge part of why um, I was on the school board in the first place was to be that kind of voice for kids and um, families and to help um, lead through a, a challenging time. And, you know, no one's perfect. And I, every time I make a decision, I always pray about it. But there's always things that, A, you don't know, and then other people don't, you know, information you're not fully getting. And then um, sometimes when people see things happening too, I feel like that was kind of the challenging part of leading during that time is it looks one way to people who are you know, outside of the situation. But when you're in the situation, there's a so much more information, mm. that's maybe either confidential that you can't share, or that is so heavily detailed that is hard to communicate in a way that people um, understand. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, you're brave. <laughs> yeah, I, because, I think you know, I feel that when God put you in a higher position, it's higher evil too. what you're fighting for. Yeah. You know, and I know that w the wisdom we can have is through Jesus, right. you know, but we're humans. Right. So when, when we when I make decisions, sometimes it's blurry. Right. And the thing we need to do, and you mentioned that, yeah. and I'm so proud of you, that you pray. Yeah. Because always. he's the one who give us uh, more cl clarity. Cl yeah. Mm -hmm. Clarity. Clarity. Yeah. yeah. For, yeah. And sometimes you don't, I feel like you don't have that clarity. And, and you just, need to take a decision. Make, yeah. And, and that's what's so scary too. You're like, well, I'm going to pray. I'm mm. going to just hope that mm. my logic plus the prayer and the... And have faith. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I feel like I would say things and I didn't really know what I was saying, but it would hit people in a certain way. And that's the Holy Spirit. That mm. wasn't like me. And that's great because like, I fully, yeah. I don't need to be that person who yeah. has the, the words. And more that this world, you know, Every we all are different, and we all have our, our perceptions. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I can read people, and then can feel people. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because God is in me, and the Holy Spirit talked to me, and He's my best friend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I know the devil, right. you know, too. Yeah. So, uh, I can I can feel people, and I know your heart is authentic. So people can come and tell me other things like, no, you don't know that person. Yeah. No, you don't know what you're talking. But it's their perception of what other right. people, you know, and we all talk a lot and how, you know, like this game, like I come to you and yeah. I tell you something yeah. and they pass it and it's all distortion. Yeah. Telefono. <laughs> Telephone. Yeah. Telefono descompuesto. Yes. So I yes. feel like I never believe what people tell me. Like, no, no, no. You need to come and try it first. Yeah. You know, yeah. and then you give me your... Um, your take. Your takeaway. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Okay. Let's talk about something real important. Uh, your shoes. Oh, thank you. Okay, <laughs> I really best. like your shoes. And if you're watching right now, I mean, we're wearing, are these Adidas? Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> With the three stripes. Yeah. Yours are the what? Spezza? They're the Spezial. Speziale. Yeah. Spezial. Yeah. Mine are Samba. Yeah. These you. were the shoes my dad used to wear like back in the days when he was probably even younger than I am now. He used to wear Sambas. They still make them. Yeah. No, they're, right. they're wonderful. They're the, my favorite shoes. We were in, um, on spring break, we were in London and um, we had been to Rome. We went to Easter mass at the Vatican with the Pope, which was like the best, most amazing experience. Um, and then we went to England afterward and in between them with all that walking and all the plane travel. And I think my body just relaxed. I threw my back out. And so I was like, oh my gosh, the shoes that I brought were like not going to cut it. And so we limped into a store in London and I saw these and I basically haven't taken them off since because they're so comfortable. <laughs> yes. So you, yeah. your kids have them? Uh, my son does. One of my 15 year old does. Um, 
they kind of like all have their own favorite shoes that they like. One of my sons, he has very specific tastes in shoes, so he always gets what he likes, but these are my favorite. What an important question. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we're (laughs) utilizing our time like effectively. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Because time is precious. What, what's your, do you have an MLS team? Not really. I haven't had time no? to pay. I like Everton, so I like um, British soccer. Ah, okay. Yeah. Nice. I'm not super familiar with that, so let's skip that one. <laughs> okay, so in terms of uh, marketing and maybe even politicians, because you said your background is kind of like in that, you know, computer mm-hmm. science, and you ran a campaign that you didn't really know how to at the beginning. I can relate to that. I was telling you before we recorded that one of my first episodes, I think it's episode five, I was basically starting the podcast brand new, like didn't really know what I was doing other than, you know, I have a dream. (laughs) But I thought, what if I pair the former mayor of Costa Mesa, Steve Menzinger, with the current mayor of Bristol, UK, because I had a friend who worked for his campaign. So maybe if if you know somebody to run your campaign, I know somebody who successfully ran his campaign two times and he won in a city of like, I forgot, like, over a million people or something like that, big city. Um, And she was my friend when we were in Mexico, she came to study and blah, blah, blah. So she connected me to him so that we could pair these two uh, politicians together and just talk about and wrestle with ideas. So anyways, all that to say, I think some people have this assumption, especially I'm from Mexico and Millie could attest Mm. to that, that in Mexico, like you think politician, and immediately you think, okay, somebody's gonna lie, somebody's gonna tell a story, somebody's gonna propose something that's never gonna happen. Um, can you relate to that? I mean, as as you step into the world of politics, is that true? Is that just marketing? What what is? Well, I mean, I think what's your take I on it? I think there's like that's a good question. It's like really complicated too. But like I think this is my third time I've run for office, and I think the. If you're newer at what you're doing, sometimes you can say things that you want to do without really knowing your your ability to do so. And um, I think that, for example, with city council now, I think that there's things that we can do to improve homelessness in the homelessness issue in Newport Beach. I think it's tempting because that's what people want to hear, that you're going to come in and like Totally Please. eradicate homelessness. You're going to fix the whole problem. Well, someone who's on the city council is the city council. Then there's the county government. Then there's the state. Then there's the fact that there's people with mental health issues and drug issues. It's really complicated. Um, and I think that if, if you come in and you say, well, I think I can help. I have strategies to improve homelessness by, you know, one to 2%. That is not a very exciting person to vote for but that's the most honest way of saying and then Mm. what happens if you don't improve them by one to two percent what if you only improve them by 0.5 percent and who's tracking those statistics and people are very quick to jump on you 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 lied you know that kind of thing i think that when your campaign speech and marketing speech is all about um giving people an idea of who you are as a person or if I'm selling sunscreen, like what what is that sunscreen going to do in an ideal world? Mm. And I think the problem with political speech tying what people hope to do, people with good hearts hope hope to do in an ideal world is that can get very conflated with people who are doing it all about ego. And they want to be the person who comes in and says, I have the solution and I'm going to solve all your problems. Vote for me. Mm. And I think that people naturally maybe want to believe that person who says, I'm going to solve all of your problems, vote for me. Um, because that's exciting. You found a hero. Everyone wants a hero, right? Like they, all the stories. Um, but I, and I think coming in and saying, I will do the best that I can and it will be a little bit better than things are. It's not like maybe the most compelling argument. So I think that's where like the gray area is in between that uh, of people. And then there's just people, like you said, people's hearts. People are doing it sometimes because um, they want the attention and the ego and all the things that maybe that kind of like power would bring. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, I think, where the, where that perception of like being a liar comes in, you know, mm-hmm. which could probably happen in in any other aspect of life. Like it could happen in a you no know, for a CEO who's yeah. just there because of mm, power. Right, like it can happen not just in politics but in business and I don't know any other yeah any area. Right, 
And I think that's like the great temptation of life, right? Why are mm. you doing something to like get power or to serve? And I think people have to navigate that as they go through. Cause I think even the best people who might go into things with a servant's heart can easily become corrupted mm. by power. And then uh, people who are in power because of the wrong reasons, maybe they have a transformation. It's really hard to know like the hearts of the people who are doing it. I think you just have to go ultimately by um, their actions, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And you see it Ooh, in scripture. That, that is a good one. Yeah. You see it in scripture yes. again and again. Because, like, I've been reading the Bible in a year. Yeah. This year, right? So I'm still, like, basically in the Old Testament. Yeah. But it's like story after story of people kind of like proposing, you know, I mean, in, in their case, it's, it's probably more around like, okay, God spoke to me and I think this is the way we should lead. Yeah. But then people coming up to them and complaining, right? Like Moses, it yeah. happens to Moses again and again, like Moses, I know. come on, we were better in Egypt. Why are you bringing us out of Egypt into like and this poor desert? And this guy coming to God, God, help <laughs> yeah. me. I can't handle these people anymore. Yeah. yeah. So hard. And, but, but at the same time, I think there's the bravery of those who, who take the lead. And I think there's something to that, you know, because you're saying you're speaking about a servant's heart. Mm -hmm. And I think the servant's heart is is that idea that I can do more with my life. Like I can add, like there's purpose yeah. for maybe even the knowledge I have and the vision I can have of, of the future, whether it's for, you know, a school board or whether it's for a city or um, a country. Yeah. Right, but you have a vision and you feel like, okay, I think things could be better. And it's brave to say, I mean, in this case, maybe like vote for me <laughs> because I can take us yeah. to that place, to yeah. the promised land in a sense, right? But yeah. what do you say to the, uh, I think that if, if in the scripture it happens, what have you experienced as far as like criticism or people maybe pointing the finger back at you and like, hey, you're taking us the wrong, yeah. the wrong place. You know, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I think the thing where people, I was reading about a different politician and how a lot of people, on a Democrat who has started voting more conservatively, for example. And I think the thing that is the same thing, whether you're Democrat or Republican, is um Sometimes the the things that you are saying, people assume that if you, they go, okay, great, we love you, you're on the same page, we really believe in everything that you do, therefore you're going to make all the same choices that we would. And I think people get really frustrated when they see people who they think are on the same page as them make different decisions than mm. they would in that case. And I think that's when you get like, oh, they're fake, you know, like they're, I think that's the criticism that I probably have run into myself the most and lots of people in leadership run into is people assume that if you, you know, have the same principles and if you have the same things that ultimately you're going to make the same decisions. Um, but I think that that's, you know, there's, like I said, there's other factors that people don't always know. And then there's other just approaches, I think, to solving problems. I think there's the, there's always the person who's going to be the loud person who's going to say like all the things that we should do. Um, And maybe if you're a governor or if you're, you know, if you're the the kind of the head of the the CEO, basically, if you're the top of the heap, maybe you can be the one who's going to say, we're loud, we're going to take a stand on that. Um, I think the challenge in local government is, one, you run into the people you know in the market and they might not feel, the even though you're on the same page, they might give you a different perspective um, than another person you know has. And that might lead you to make a different choice because you'll go, okay, there's not just these people who want this, there's other people who want this. And then I think the other part of it is being able to solve problems. Sometimes all the information um, isn't available to the public and you have to think about what other repercussions might be. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably the... You, you think that happens in... I mean, if it happens at this more like local level, yeah, because you said uh, some information is not available to everybody, that's kind of where conspiracy theories come from, no? Like right. on, on the more like global scale, like, yeah. well, the president knows something that the rest of the population mm -hmm. doesn't know. Sure. And he needs to make a decision based on that information that we don't know. Like, is that, is that, do you think that's the same, maybe just a bigger scale of that? Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's probably, I always like love, so there's a, a naval cruiser that was 
bombed in like the 60s and the government said it was a an accident and um they went back later and they found out that it wasn't an accident because the they bombed the US naval cruiser because they assumed that it was a spy ship but because the person the they bombed uh our ship and they were like maybe an ally of ours um people went, oh, like it's a conspiracy. And they covered it up. And eventually they like came out with, actually, you know, it wasn't an accident. They did the wrong thing. But that kind of thing is like a challenge where people have to decide whether or not to like release that information and own it. And like, I think that part should always be transparent. People should put that out there. And, you know, if people don't like the narrative, that's one thing. But I think then there's other things which um, are hard when you're prote- protecting um like confidentiality of like people mm. that people have the right to, you know, medical confidentiality or people have the right to kind of like hiring and fire, just like, you know, whatever confidentiality we've decided as a society, people need, need to be respected to have. I think that's where, that's where it gets like challenging. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to look at a piece of scripture where something really challenging happens to the local governor. Uh-huh. And people might be familiar with this or not, but it's actually in the Apostles' Creed. Okay, if you're not familiar with the Apostles' Creed, but you're maybe a Catholic or a Christian, I'm just going to read it real quick so that you familiarize with where we're going, okay? Uh, the Apostles' Creed is basically what every Christian believes, right? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. Right? I think every Christian believes that, right? Uh, Suffer under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father Almighty. And then, you know, a little bit more stuff happens. But what I love is the part where it says, uh, like the early disciples believed Jesus, like this is true. Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. So Pontius Pilate is the local governor, right? In Judea, in the region where Jesus was kind of like doing his ministry. So I'm going to put it on the screen and we're just going to kind of like look at it and and see how you react to this. And maybe as a, as a politician, you know, maybe where do you see the problem happening here? Uh, how you would have done maybe things differently. Yeah. Um, so we'll just we'll just look at it and see how we react. Okay. Matthew twenty seven. And just for the people that are just listening, I'm gonna read out of the amplified version. I really like this because it offers you like way more insights into what you're reading. So it says Jesus before Pilate, Matthew twenty seven. Now Jesus stood before Pilate, the governor, and the governor asked him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said to him, It is as you say. And then it gives you, you know, kind of like where you can find this same scenario in other gospels. So mm-hmm. it's also in Luke and it's also in John, right? But when the charges were brought up against him by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Jesus did not answer, right? Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear? how many things they are testifying against you. But Jesus did not reply to him. Let's just stop right there before we continue, okay? Uh, Okay. How do you feel about Jesus not replying to the authority? Like, how does that stir anything in you? Like, have you ever even faced situations like that where like, hey, we are, we're the city council, you need to respond to us. Uh, Is that, I mean, I'm I'm guessing it's got to be frustrating. Yeah, right? <laughs> well, I've never faced anything like that, but um, I guess I just look at it more from a perspective of, um, in a way, Jesus knew he was kind of walking into a trap, you know? Mm. Like, the question wasn't really a question. Of course, he knew the charges that were brought against him. Of course, he knew he could answer, but I think it was more sort of like they talk about in other places of the Bible of, one, turning the other cheek, and two... If you're walking, you see it all all throughout the Bible where he's talking and people ask him questions and he doesn't answer it directly because they're not really asking that question. They're mm. trying to trap him <laughs> or trick him. Mm. Um, and so what's he going to answer? It's like, yeah, sure. Yes, I know the charges. And then, then the line of question could continue. Well, are you guilty of the charges? Well, he's not going to go there because the 
you know, one, he knows the charges. Two, he knows he's not guilty. Three, he knows it's a trap. So I think um, his silence is just sort of a humility of understanding that this is what God's will is ultimately going to be. Um, and, you know, to further go down the, the the tricky road of questioning is kind of futile. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Okay, so let's continue reading. And let me put it right back here. Well, that's a bad angle. <laughs> let's put it on, I think I had it. Oh, yeah, this one. Okay. So, Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they are testifying against you? So, what you said, right? But Jesus did not reply to him, not even to a single accusation. So, the governor was gently astonished. Now, at the feast... Of the Passover, the governor was in a habit of setting free any prisoner whom the people chose. And at the time, they were holding a notorious prisoner called Barabbas, who was guilty of insurrection and murder. Wow. So when they had assembled for their purpose, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to set free for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? For Pilate knew that it was because of jealousy that the chief priests and elders had handed Jesus over to him. Okay, so let's stop right at this one too, because I think the the juxtaposition of of a man who's innocent, right, and another one who's clearly murderous, like he like they know he's already there because of what he's done, right? And and maybe I don't know. Do you feel like Pilot as a politician, he's just kind of like maybe playing tricks with the people. Just kind of like, okay, who do you, I'm going to release one every year I do it. Who do you want? Kinda, even before, because we know he's going to wash his hands later on, yeah. right? And say, okay, ultimately it's your decision, not mine. Yeah. But what do you think is happening when, why is he bringing this, this, uh, you want me to release Jesus? Is he just leaving it to the people to decide as a politician? Is that, is that I, the right attitude even? I mean, I re- one, as a politician, too, you really, you really, I think you really want to listen to the will of the people. I mean, ultimately, you have mm-hmm. to decide what you think is best for the people. You can't always just go with, I mean, even if you're a democracy, you can't just go with the majority because, again, there's other things at play. He knew that the chief priests had brought them Barabbas because they were jealous. Did all the people know that? I don't know that all the people knew that. So he could have said, okay, well, I. I'm going to throw it out to the will of the people because maybe the people are going to say, no, release Jesus, Barabbas, Barabbas is a notorious criminal. And then he could kind of, you know, on the one hand, get off the hook a little bit easier because he figured the people would have the right answer and he could go along with what the people said. And he could say, oh, chief priest, sorry. You know, like the, the people have spoken, um, but that wasn't, you know, that that wasn't what was supposed to happen. So he had to then go that step further. Mm-hmm. I see it a little bit with... Um, uh, Maybe so in El Salvador, right? It's a it's a country that has been uh, plagued by by crime, mostly because of like the gangs and you no, know, yeah, I think that's basically the Mara the, Salvatrucha. Yeah, Mara Salvatrucha. <laughs> Uh, so like the other, uh, he's like super on social media. You know, Najib Bukele. So he posted a social media post where. The army is out in the streets and they're like, okay, there's another gang and we localize them and we send, I mean, thousands of armed men to kind of like get them, you know? And I think in a sense, like the, here the assumption is like, oh yeah, the criminals should be in jail, right? right. But to say we're going to release the criminal, that, that would be kind of like a far-fetched thing for a politician to do right or yeah don't don't you think he is kind of expecting the people to say like don't release the don't release the notorious criminal yeah and instead they came back with no we want them and he probably was like well shoot this is not it's not going the way i thought (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah, totally so it's almost like he's he's being against he's being put against how do you say like a Rock in a hard place. A rock in yeah. a hard place, right? In español decimos entre la espada y la pared. A rock in a hard place where like, oh, wow, this is... Because I think as a politician, you, you're you kind of like thinking of a strategy, right? And here's a case that they brought you in the morning and you're like, okay, what do you want? <laughs> right. Type of thing. Because he ends up, later on, he ends up saying, well, you guys have your own kind of like way to go about these things. You deal with it right. on your own, right? 
I like, think almost any, like don't bother me and, this morning. Any <laughs> leaders probably got going through that too, where they have to come up with a strategy too, not just yeah. politics, but anytime you're leading like a big group, you're like, all right, how are we going to make sure everyone is on board with this idea? How yeah. are we going to move forward with what needs to be done? Yeah. Okay. So let's get to the point where now the woman is going to be involved mm -hmm. in this pilot's wife. And this is the only gospel where she's brought up. Let me see if I can. Okay. There. We have it on the screen again. So Pilate knew that it was because of jealousy that the chief priests and elders had handed Jesus over to him. While he was seated on the judgment seat, seat his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous and innocent man. I mean, those are bold declarations by a wife who is uh, the wife of a Roman governor. And like, is she, I mean, and you know, some people might even come to the conclusion that she was some sort of like a believer or a follower of Jesus, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we're just reading the text. Right. But how do you feel about this, right? So have nothing to do, these are the, the wife's words to Pilate, his husband, have nothing to do with the righteous and innocent man for last night, I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. What, what do you think about that message and that um, even like divine intervention in a sense, yeah. right? Because she, she had a dream and she's bothered by this dream and it's like, and clearly her declaration is this guy is innocent, right? So I think as a governor, like you want to do the right thing, mm -hmm. but you're, you're already against a rock and a hard place, yeah. right? I feel like, I feel like some of it has to do with Eve, you know, like the... Eve with the apple and all of those like things. Like Adam and Eve? Like Adam and Eve. And I feel like that's saying like, here's another opportunity for a woman to, to come in and do the opposite. She's trying to save Jesus instead of saying like, let's go. And I think there's some, oh, wow. Matthew actually in a lot does talk about like a woman's role in um, things. He alludes a lot to Eve. I think it's Matthew, um, but I'm, yeah, I'm pretty sure. And he, so I think he's pulling in kind of the, uh, woman is not the the com she's not the sole source of man's downfall through salvation i think in this way it's pulling it through and saying look a woman is there and she's trying to support jesus and not having his downfall um you could view it the other way and say that um she's tempting him to do the wrong thing because jesus ultimately the will of god is that he needs to be he needs to die um, mm -hmm. for our sins so i think to me it's just more like an interesting thing he brings in and i think it probably has to do with trying to explain the role that women have in um, eternal life and what those, you know, in that early Adam and Eve situation. Wow. Might be my guess. I never, I never thought of that contrast, but that's, that's really epic. Cause even if I, I mean, if I get too theological, which you used to do in your college years, yeah, right? So yeah, I think it's safe yeah. to do it right here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, there's this idea that Adam is, it's like the, a human representation of us. And Jesus is like the divine representation of a human, right? And so they call Adam like the first Adam and Jesus like almost like a second Adam. Mm -hmm. So it's almost to bring the contrast of Adam lived. He was like the introducer of sin in a sense. Mm -hmm. But then Jesus is like the opposite end. It's like the contrasting is the man that lived righteously throughout all his life, mm -hmm. right? So never committed sin, mm -hmm. even though, I mean, he was tempted, right? The Bible clearly says he was tempted by Satan and he took him to the desert and like all these things. So, uh, but I think in this sense to have almost that human vision of, of Pilate's wife as, as some sort of like Eve, yeah, because right? he's bringing, like you said, he's the righteous man versus uh -huh. Adam as a crop. To me, that's that's what I get out of it when I right. read that. Yeah, because in the, I guess if if you read uh, Genesis, I don't know, some people would say, "Wow, it's the it's uh, Eve's fault," yeah, because she kind of like lead Adam into the temptation and you know, eating of the fruit and blah blah blah. But in this case, it's almost like saying, right, portraying a a better version of a woman, yeah, who's even without. Even without like the background of faith, right? Right, like she's not of the Jewish community in right. that mm -hmm. sense, right? But yeah. for her to say, "This is a righteous man," yeah, that says a lot. 
Yeah. Right? It's, it tells you that God is working even outside of our, like, oh, I'm a Christian yeah. or I'm a Catholic or, you know, God could mm. be working in the life of uh, right. other traditions or whatever, right? Right. And at that time, he was in the Jewish community and saying that Jesus isn't just for people in the Jewish community. He's for, you know, this Roman governor's wife as well outside of that yeah. community. He's for everybody. Mm. Yes. And proof of that is that later on, one of the first followers of I, I would say Jesus right but because of the apostles it's a Roman officer named Cornelius mm -hmm. and Peter had this vision right that okay a man is coming to me and he's like well clearly the gospel can be for the mm -hmm. Gentiles right and especially for a Roman officer who mm -hmm. they were the ones that crucified Jesus right but he ends up believing in all his household right Right, so yeah, I think wow, that's really cool. Yeah, that that she had a, and it's the only mention of her. Like the other gospels don't mention the little message by this right. woman. Yeah, so I think that's epic. You know that we can have. That's why I love about the Bible that sometimes you read it and you're like, okay, the woman had a dream, so what? Yeah, mm -hmm. but really pay attention. Like why? Yeah. why do the other gospels don't mention it, and why does Matthew mention it? Right, mm -hmm. so I think there's always like. Not, not, I think it's more than knowledge. There's wisdom that we can learn right. by peeking into like what's happening and what's not happening yeah. in sometimes, what we're reading. Sometimes I feel like, especially like the Old Testament, you read something and you're like, oh, how did that end up in there? You know? Oh, I know. Or, <laughs> but even this one, you could be like, okay, like you said, his wife had a dream. Why is that part of the story? Mm. You know, what does that have to do with anything? Yeah. yeah. So if you were, if you had, here we have a case of Pilate. And Jesus, face to face, mm -hmm. right? A governor. If you had Jesus physically face to face, what type of questions, what would you want to know from him? What kind of questions would you ask him? Um, I mean, I guess the, th the thing I always ask in the morning is how can I fully participate in your will today? You know, what do you, what do you, what do you need? Nice. <laughs> Faithful servant. That's cool. Okay. Let's go to this one, okay? Before before we move on to that one. This is, uh, what are these guys called? Official Faith Division of Turning Point USA, Faith in Action. Uh, so it's basically a bunch of believers, like I would say maybe evangelicals, sure. who are concerned about what's been taught in schools. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this priest shows up at a city council, and I think it's a specifically... Uh, school districts meeting. Sure. Okay. And he shows up and starts reading a book mm -hmm. that is available to kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to read it. And my point is not what you think about what he's reading and like all this thing. You know, my point is like, how would you react if that would happen in your district? Sure. Okay. So keep that in mind. Two books available at multiple high schools and SBS. This is what it says. So he bends me over the bed. That's pretty, I, I, <laughs> pretty graphic. He says, he'll go slower. Eventually, he finishes and pulls out. The condom, of course, is covered in S-H-I-T. The condom is K. Is this, is this what we're teaching in Springfield Public Schools? If this book remains in the school system, you all are either pumps or perverts. Every last one of you have a responsibility to do what's in the best interest of children. And if teaching them about and feces on condoms is what the left wants you to do, then you need to go right and do what's best for the kids. Thank you, John. Hey, Thank you, John. Okay. <laughs> All right. So my point is not uh, what do you believe about this, you know, and whether you're like, left or right or or yeah. that is if something like this would happen in your district i don't know if it's happened before right Similar, <laughs> so <yeah>. probably uh, <laughs> not quite that bad what would be what's your reaction you know what well i mean i'd have to say thank you john too and here's why mm -hmm. you can't comment when people come up to give a public comment so that's what people always wonder why when people come to a meeting like city council <clears throat> or school board whatever why the person who's sitting there just says okay thanks because legally, that meeting is the meeting of the board, and you can't discuss anything that's not on the agenda mm. in advance. Because it, then the public doesn't have the transparency to come and know what's going to be on the agenda. So, 
if you were to put that topic on the agenda, then you could have like a real, you know, you put on conversation. The, yeah, you could put that topic on the agenda. It'd be published for three days in advance. People could come and you could have a conversation in public about what you mm-hmm. think. But what people often want and they're disappointed to get is the understanding of what that meeting is, is they think it's a meeting between the school board members and the public, like a town hall. It's not. It's a meeting. It's a it's the board's business meeting, and people are allowed oh, wow. to come and comment. Oh, um, wow. Same with city council. So, yeah. um, is that a better way to do what what John tried to do, or is that okay to do? Or, I mean, I think that's good. It's, I think as long as the public understands what the response of the people they're coming to talk to will be, um, and even if they're disappointed because they wanted to see some kind of feedback, like as long I think that people, I love public comment, even when I don't appreciate the content of it necessarily because mm-hmm. I think people need to be able to um, give us information. I always prefer when I know in advance mm-hmm. um, but sometimes it's great because other board, you can't if say some, say John came to me in advance and told me all this information, I can't then send it out to all my other board members behind the scenes and go, isn't this shocking? We should do something because all of our decisions have to be made in public. So well. sometimes when people come and give these shocking public comments, it's good because the other board members or council members or whatever, they get actually get to hear what's going on and they can, uh, then we can put it on the agenda and then we can discuss later. Um, I don't, you know, there's an, it's called the Brown Act basically. And ba- you can't um, communicate between each other. So if I know something and I'm really fired up about it, I can't call all of my other school board members on a Saturday or a day that we don't have a meeting and say, this is just shocking. What should we do? Because that's illegal. Because that's considered. Oh wow! That's considered a, a, a what they call a serial meeting or a non-agendized meeting. Everything that you discuss has to be. Um, if there's a majority of you, everything has to be agendized and has to be discussed in public. Other than, like we said, like student discipline or things like which are confidential in nature. But everything else. So when you get something like that, um, it's shocking, and you know, um, you you hope that that's never something that's in your libraries. Um, but at the same time, like the, the feedback will never be a dialogue with that person at that kind of a meeting. Love it. Well, thank you for sharing. And I, I didn't know, so now I'm learning. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like I didn't know it's technically a, it's a meeting amongst amongst the council and you get to watch it publicly, yeah. but it's not an interaction necessarily mm-hmm. with the public. Right. Right? I didn't know that. So that's something... New. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. So what we're going to do is I call this going from blasphemous to divine. Okay. Okay. So in the world of politics, in your world, we go from the worst idea to the best idea. Right? So blasphemous is the one on the left mm-hmm. and there's five of them. So when you think of the role of... I don't know, politics, just take it wherever you want to take it, Okay. right? What is the worst idea out there, the most blasphemous that you can think of? Um, I think any legislation that seeks to take the um, power away from the family unit is, is the worst because I think um, the family is the protection against, um, you know, tyranny. I think that strong families um, need to be protected. Wow. Okay. Moving on. What are you skeptical of in the world of politics? Um, anyone who claims to be your friend without really knowing you very well. Ooh. <laughs> Ouch. Let me come back again. Ouch. Ouch. <laughs> okay. That's, that's, that's a good one. Uh, inspired. Where do you see inspiration? What gives you hope in the world of politics? Um, two things, um, people who, well, one, George Washington, because he was somebody who could have been king and stayed leading the country and decided to step back when he felt like he was no longer needed. Um, other politicians have done that as well. So anytime people take the call to lead and then when God's done with their service, they go, okay, I don't need that for me anymore. That's inspirational. And then also our young people. Um, it's really inspiring to see how people in their you know teens and 20s are really excited to kind of take on um, leadership and responsibility and in a actually i think less self-serving way than previous generations wow epic a uh, holy idea according to michelle barto a holy idea uh-huh oh um 
Uh-huh. <laughs> That's a tough one. It's like politics, you want things to be like a little bit separated so that everyone well, see. Mm-hmm. I think that if when I was at the beginning of the school year, or the beginning of the year, January, I guess, um, I always do my goals. I'm like, what are my goals for the year? I want to do all these things. And I think the idea that came to me was instead of goals for this year, which is, was kind of scary for me to not like set goals, you know, um, that instead I needed to set like, I don't even, it's not really mantras or intentions because that sounds like it's like um, not in line with, with God. But I think my uh, inspiration, my holy idea was that instead to set um, kind of goals around um, what I think I should do for the year, how I should grow. So I, I prayed and I came away with a, a few of them. Um, and one of them I think was just that I, so I always like write my goals down on my mirror so that I, for the whole year, so that I can stick to them. And said, I got rid of that this year. And one of the things I wrote was to um, fully participate in the will of the Lord was, was one of my, was my holy idea. So I'll say that. That was, wow. that, yeah. So that's on my mirror. And then every morning when I look at it, I'm like, that's, that's, your goal for the year. It's not like a specific goal. It's not, you know, make a million dollars. It's not get 40 new clients. Yeah. You know, it's not anything else. It's that's, that's my goal. Wow. That's moving. That is so holy. Yeah. Holy participate in the will of the Lord. Wow. That's a big, 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 big one. Okay. And lastly, the most, so you're going to top that. I don't know <laughs> how, but what is the most divine idea in the world of politics? <laughs> um, I think the most divine idea is, well, I think freedom is probably the most divine idea because um, that you see how God gives all of his children freedom, you know, to choose. He, um, people can choose whether they follow him or don't follow him. And he gave them the ability to have that freedom to choose. So I think, um, I think freedom. And when we choose him, we have freedom. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Then we, that, that's the next part. So cute. You've like fully, if you choose God, then you find that you had even more freedom than mm -hmm. you um, found. But yeah. Beautiful. Oh, he, he is a trompoque. <laughs> so good. It was so good. So good. Oh, it was so good. Okay. I'm trying to put my, my last music here. Couldn't find it. Oh, this one's fun. Okay, so thank you for being here, Michelle. Yes, this was you. awesome. Was so Coffee, cheers. cheers. Yes. Pium. Thank you very much. This was really fun. Ching, ching. Yes. Okay, so thank you for being here, my friends. You know you can like, subscribe, rate this episode. Millie, what's your, your final emoji for today's podcast? Mm, I feel totally inspired. Inspired. Okay, there we have it. Michelle, what's your like overall emoji feeling today? Um, do you have to pick one of the five? Yeah, one of the five oh, right okay. there. Um, well, I'm going to do the halo one. Halo, okay. Holy. Yeah. There we go. Holy emoji. For me, it's going to be, you know me, Black the shocking animal. one. It's going to be like, what? <laughs> politics? Beto talking about politics again? Wow. This was super fun. Thank you so much, my friends, for listening, watching. You know, you can visit us at christianpodcast.com. Where can people, like, if they want to pray for you, they can pray for you. But if yeah. they want to maybe get to know you more, is there a, is there, can they do that? Yeah. Um, Place where they can go? I guess if they wanted to know more about, um, I guess I should share my campaign website. Yes, please. do. Okay. Uh, do it. It's Michelle, uh, it's Barto for Newport, B A. B A R T O F O R N E W P O R T dot com. Okay, it's long. We will share it right here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what, what, what is it? <laughs> Barto, it's Michelle? Barto for Newport. Barto for Newport. Yeah, and my Instagram is Michelle number four, Newport. Okay, Michelle number four. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, th this is so much fun. I never get to talk about this stuff. Ah, awesome. uh, so good. I love it. Well, there we go. Bye bye, everybody. See you on the next one. Love you, bye.